Thank you very much for, for inviting me to give this talk. The, the title I gave myself is Pixel Processor Arrays for Low Latency Vision on Agile Robots. It's, 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 it's a talk about a SCAMP vision sensor. Uh, it's, it's a long title for that. But uh, so I will, I will talk about, uh, yeah, okay, let me, let me go to the motivation. So really, uh, the problem here is uh, computer vision on agile robots. And, and the challenge is that the vision is compute intensive. So anyone who wants to uh, compute uh, fast, but at the same time computing a small footprint, small footprint with low power, uh, faces this challenge that you know we cannot use a big CPU, big GPU. You cannot send data to the cloud on small and agile platforms. You have to have some answer to how we can execute this uh, compute-intensive vision algorithms uh, in this in this situation. And so that's what we're trying to to work on. And so the conventional pipeline really is not appropriate, right? You cannot just sense the data with a with a with a conventional uh, sensor turn it into some digital data, send lots of him. And if you were trying to move it, put it on an agile platform, maybe you need, you know, uh, hundreds or thousands of Hertz response. So you cannot really send frames at that rate and then hope that you'll be able to process it with some kind of massive uh, compute hardware. And with all this data sloshing around between GPU and, and, and CPUs and the memory, that all wastes uh, time and energy. So our idea is, well, get rid of this conventional camera system and, and, and put a vision sensor at the front end, something that will not transmit images, but already uh, meaningful data. Okay, so uh, if you do that, if you do if you perform computations on sensor itself, we can get rid of all this, uh, all this hardware and replace it with a, some, some low power microcontroller, maybe a flight controller on a UAV or something like this. The bulk of the processing occurs in the, in the sensor itself. So that's the... Uh, that's the basic idea, and, and with this, you should be able to, to get a high performance uh, and, and good capabilities at a reduced power cost and size of the system. Now, the question, of course, is what that, what that meaningful data is. I mean, there are many, many different tasks that you want, may want to do. In, we've seen the nice two talks on event-based sensors, where, where the decision is the meaningful data is a change in the uh, pixel intensity. And so those devices, uh, transfer not image frames, but uh, changes in pixel intensities. But if you look a bit more general, there's lots and lots of other things you may want to do. And that meaningful data could be results of your spatial temporal filtering, or maybe results of segmentation or optic flow, maybe subtraction of the background or extraction of points of interest and so forth. So you may want to do more on the sensor uh, than just one function. You may want to do all, lots of different things. Now, how can you do lots of different things on a, on a sensor? So really, we want to optimize that sensor for application, but at the same time, we don't really want to build a new sensor for, for each of those different tasks. So you want a sensor that is uh, programmable, uh, which means you need some sort of a computer, right? You need something that you can program to perform uh, different, uh, different operations. And, and if you have that, then of course you can just write your code and execute your, your customized algorithm that will still extract this meaningful data, meaningful to you for that application and output it out of the sensor device. Now we know how to build uh, efficient computers for pixel processing. Essentially, what you have if you take an image is that you, you're doing pretty much the same thing in one part of the image and the same thing in another part of the image. For the low level image operations, you are just computing something based on uh, pixels and, and their, their, their local neighbors, and you do the same thing over and over again the entire image. And so some sort of parallel processor array, parallel computer is appropriate. I mean, GPUs, that's why are pretty successful at doing this sort of operations. Essentially, you, want, you probably want something which is single instruction, multiple data. You do the same things on all the pixels, but you use, at, at each of those processors, you have different data, different pixels of the image. If you do that, then of course, the more processors you would be uh, putting at the, at the job of processing all these pixels, the, the better you will do. Ultimately, in the extreme version, you could, you could have a processor per, per pixel in the image. And so this is the, the, the problem is what some people call embarrassingly parallel. You have uh, lots of parallelism in the problem of, of, of pixel level processing. And so you could have a very huge number of processors. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do, but not only having a processor per pixel, but actually trying to put the processor inside the pixel of the image sensor. So the basic premise is that we can 
integrate not just the processing and memory, but also uh, integrate that with the sensing in, in a very tight, tight architecture. So that's, uh, so that's the basic idea of a vision sensor, which will, uh, it's like an image sensor chip, but in the chip you have uh, photo detectors as well as processing circuitry next to the pixels. The, the, those processors are very generic, right? They can do, they can do any task. So the, the entire system really takes the light and turns it into whatever are your uh, things of interest, the features, descriptors, locations. There could be events, there could be kind of temporal events, but it could be all sorts of other things as well. And so then if you have a pretty generic processor in each pixel, you can just write one program to do one job and write another program to do something else and write another program to do yet another thing. Now the challenge of course is to put a, to, a from point of view of designing the system is, is how you put a functionality, which you, there needs to be some, some ALU, some uh, logic unit. There has to be some local memory. There has to be effectively entire processor inside one single pixel of the image. And then you replicated that all over. And, and in my group, we've been working on, uh, on, on methods for, for doing that. I will not talk about the, the actual design. I, I will show you this. The, the examples that I have in this talk are uh, all recorded with the SCAMP 5 vision chip. It's an array of 256 by 256 processors. So in terms of pixel resolution, it's not very high resolution. Uh, in term of, terms of a number of processors, that's a reasonably high number of processor cores. There are 65,000 processor cores on this chip. Uh, so, and again, we kind of trading off the resolution for, for the frame rate almost, so pretty much like with my, with my slides here. Uh, so the, the, the clock of a single processor is pretty low, but because of a very large number of processors, the overall performance of this, of this compute system is, is quite high. And so the, the figures are about 600 gigaops at about a watt. Uh, but it also has to be said, this, is, th this design is in a very old silicon technology. It's 20 years old, uh, old technology. So there is a 20 years of Moore's law that we could still exploit uh, to, to, to make it go faster and, and more power efficient. Okay, we've also built a, an entire camera system based on this, uh, on this idea. So we have to integrate uh, you know, some periphery to make it usable. You have to also provide uh, programming tools and some kind of framework for, for writing programs for those little pixel processors and so on. So we've, we've put a lot of effort into trying to, uh, to make that reasonably usable. I mean, as much effort as you, as you can afford within the constraints of uh, uh, academic projects. And I just want to show you some of the, uh, of the examples of things that, that we've been doing with this. First are some simple algorithms. So uh, here on the left, there is just an image captured by the sensor on the right is the result of some very simple processing and edge detector, a Sobel edge detector. Now the idea is not that you would be uh, computing edge detectors and outputting this off the chip. This is pretty much for example of what you can do. Hopefully, you know, that edge detector would be just first step of a more complex algorithm. It runs at about 5.8 microseconds, but you can see how, how the edge detection works. I mean, it works as, as you would expect uh, it to work. But the, all the computation is done inside the, the, the pixels of the device with, the, with a little program that does edge detection. Okay, there is a, here I have another example. It's, a, it's an optical flow. So here, again, we write little code for those pixel processors to do something else. Here, they are computing basically the best the best matching uh, patch for each pixel. You know, where, how does it move from a frame to a frame? So there is some kind of heat map here that shows the direction of the motion. So it's, it's, it's a block matching optic flow. Now the, it, it takes about 0.4 milliseconds to compute. So again, you, you probably want to use it not on its own, but as, as an input to some further processing stage. Uh, here is something maybe a little bit more interesting. We, we run a corner detector on, so it's again a little program in this pixel processors that runs a corner detector. Uh, I'm showing you on the left there are the results of those of those corner detectors with shown with green squares, and there are those rainbow tracks that show how the how those corners move. So we we are we are actually recording more points than we are showing frames. So the frames are about 60 frames per second. We are showing the the recorded corners at 450 480 frames per second. 
you can do even better if you don't output grayscale images at all. So we just forget about grayscale images. We don't want to see them. All we want to see is the points. So if you look at the right, we are extracting those corner points without uh, showing the images. And again, I'm, I'm moving this kind of camera pretty fast and, and, and all those tracks are showing all the points that are actually being recorded and returned by the system. So we are, we are extracting key points at 2000 frames per second. And we have a very low data rate because we only output the address events. We only output the coordinates of the points of interest. So with a pretty low bandwidth, we, we output some relatively complex information, the, the locations of the corners in the image. Uh, we kind of tried to push it as, as far as we could. And we, the fewer points you are returning, yeah, the more you compress the data on the sensor, the faster you can go. So here we implemented a system where we are just extracting one point of interest from the entire image, which is a location of a closed object, you know, as, as opposed to an open object. And we are spinning, we are spinning that wheel on the, on the end of a, of a Dremel drill. And we are trying to extract the, the coordinate and we were able to demonstrate doing that at 100,000 frames per second. So at 100,000 frames per second, we are looking at the image, capturing that, finding out a circle among the seas, and finding out a center of that, and sending out the coordinate out of the sensor. So that's the only thing that is being sent per frame, a coordinate of the, of the, of the point of interest. OK, there is, there is a bunch of other things you can do if you, if you take this idea of a subframe computation. So you want to do a lot of computation before you output something. Some basic things like a high dynamic range, a, a nice way of doing this is just capturing images at lots and lots of different exposures uh, and deciding you know, what gray level you eventually want to output through some tone mapping function. And so you know, at a short exposure, you only see things that are bright. At the long exposure, you see the things that are in the shadows. If you combine them in some clever way, you can see everything. And so there is a nice algorithm that achieves all that, all that using a tone mapping. And it doesn't take any time at all, except the time that it takes to integrate the image. So the longest integration time, during that integration time, you're actually computing for the frames that were captured at a shorter integration time. So at the end of the integration, you have a full tone mapped image. All this work has been done by Julian Martel uh, at ETH Zurich. He's, I have a few things that he has done his, uh, with, uh, with the sensor chip. Another thing that he worked on is, is uh, depth from focus. It's a monocular depth system where essentially we, are, we have a liquid lens that oscillates at 60 hertz. Uh, and during that oscillation, so that liquid lens changes the, the focus of the, of, the, uh, of the camera. So you can see on the left, those four little images show the images at different focus. So we, we will capture 128 images like this uh, at 60 frames per second. So effectively 7,000 frames of, of images that we are capturing, processing that to find at each point, at each subframe, at each 660 FPS frame, we are finding the, in the image which areas are sharp, sharpest at which time, okay? So, as you change the focus from near focus to far focus, the things will come into focus. First, the things that are near and then the things that are far. If you find out the time at which things are most in focus, you find the depth, you find the, the distance to those objects. So we can create depth maps at 60 Hertz uh, with just single, single camera. And uh, so it's a purely passive system. There is no laser being emitted. It's a very nice, uh, nice solution. Another thing uh, more recent that Julian has done now, the, the previous work was done at, at ETH, this one is done at Stanford. It's uh, programming individual pixels, because we have all these processors in pixels, we can do this. We can program individual pixels with different exposure times. And, and so you can run an optimization algorithm that decides what exposures you should be running in different pixels and how to reconstruct that data that is effectively obtained by the sensor to achieve whatever is that you are interested in. So example here is of a high speed imaging where we are, uh, where, where he has trained the network to reconstruct the high frame rate images from the low frame rate data given by the, by the SCAP chip where each frame encodes different integration times in different pixels. So we have a captured, uh, captured image here. And from that image, you reconstruct 
a whole series of, of sub images. It's a, it's a very nice uh, framework, which, which can be applied to doing uh, different things as well. Here is an example where we are returning one frame from the SCAMP system, but that frame, because each of those pixels has been exposed in a different way, can be used to reconstruct a, a high level, uh, high frame rate, uh, little high frame rate video. So we are effectively reconstructing 16 frames out of, out of a single frame here. Okay, some, some other things that, that we've done, uh, and the other examples here I have are, are done by uh, Laurie Bose at University of Bristol. S uh, so they've been also using SCAMP camera. This is an implementation of a, of a very simple CNN. So, so we're trying to implement deep learning methods entirely in the, on the chip or entirely in the camera. Here we just, we implemented convolutions and the max pooling and the ReLU layers and then we, uh, we implement a, a simple NIST uh, digit recognition that again runs entirely on the, on the camera. Another thing uh, is, uh, is visual uh, we also have a, a Viken system, a motion capture system to provide the ground truth. So those tracks, the blue, the dark blue and light blue will be the motion in X direction and the light and dark uh, red would be in the Y direction. And it, uh, it, it tracks pretty well, right? So, and, and we can do this again at, at, at hundreds of uh, frames uh, per second. Uh, here is the, here's an example of uh, what, what the camera actually sees. So you can see it tries to match, we capture a keyframe and then we try to find the best uh, shift from, the, from what the camera sees to that keyframe. And if we move further away from the keyframe, we can try to capture another keyframe and, and continue like this. So uh, I, I have an example here, I think of, uh, sorry. I, I have an example here also how, uh, Okay. Uh, sorry about that. I think I think my computer has just crashed. Uh, it may recover. I will I will be happy to take questions because uh, I I think I think I my PowerPoint is just crashing. But I've seen that before. It it usually recovers. So I I was uh, I was curious if 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 uh, yeah. Um, I mean, you you showed an, an example with uh, deep with uh, neural networks, and and some other examples with more low level uh, computation. So it seemed to me like, uh, yeah, neural networks is kind of hierarchical. So I I cannot see how can it be done in in like uh, small processors in right in the pixels because you need them like uh yeah other other layers that process the output of, of the of the first layers so uh yes yeah, so yeah okay so yes so, so the initial initial layers in the neural network are pretty much convolutions so these are pixel yeah, parallel so, so we're uh -huh. running a bunch of convolution filters in the first layer now uh, as you, you can do a uh, ReLU and max like nonlinear functions and max pooling as well as you move mm -hmm. up as you move up the hierarchy obviously you lose that one-to-one -one correspondence between the the pixels in the array and the and the filters that you're running the results it, by by doing some clever mapping so by mapping uh, results of the filters because you, you typically also lose the resolution so you're kind of gain the number of representations but you you're losing the resolutions as you move upwards so you can try to exploit that and still run the computations within within pixels uh, at some point that hole kind of breaks away and you may want to run a fully connected layer either on the on the microcontroller or you can still try to run fully connected layers in the in the pixel array by uh, by just thinking about how these things map so actually we we've 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 submitted a paper to uh eccv now no to uh, it, yeah, that that shows how this can be done entirely on the chip the example i have shown is running uh, convolution layers on the chip and uh, and the rest of the layers uh in the on the microcontroller the fully connected layer on the microcontroller but actually okay. it is possible to run to run everything uh, on chip i think mm -hmm. i have my I, I think i have my slide i have my uh, powerpoint back 
So let me just uh, okay. So this okay. is the, so this is the this is the CNN and this was the odometry. Let's just skip through this. Okay, now uh, here is uh, here we, we so we we also play play with the robots. So we put this the system onto a a, a car. Uh, here the task was to detect gates which have certain symbols drawn above them and and go through the middle of the gate. So again, the whole vision processing is done on the sensor. It it looks for those uh, signs and tries to go under a under a particular symbol. Uh, another uh, another application that we could go so actually it was probably li limited mostly by 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 the controller not by uh, the vision processing speed here we just have uh, symbols that tell the car to go left or right and that can run a little faster uh, and, and the recordings at the top are done with the conventional camera so you simply just see what you would see with the webcam we are running much faster we're running at again a, a maybe thousand thousand frames per second the entire processing so that so that we can do we can do things uh, in an agile way we have a paper in in this conference uh, which is on a sort of slightly different approach to doing to doing a, a, a neural network uh, obstacle avoidance we are running some feature extraction uh, algorithms on the vision sensor the ones that we know are non-trivial but are quite easily implemented on the chip so we we're running some motion detection so some space some kind of ad hoc spatial filtering and some uh, feature detectors and for each of those uh, filters we produce a, a summarized measure of what's what's the like the amount of those features or or, or, or something about those features in a in a large receptive field and so we output only that summarized information. So basically we output 10 receptive fields, 10 numbers for one filter and then 10 another numbers from another filter and so on. And then we train a neural network on the output of those, uh, of those uh, filters to do something. And in this case, we train the network to replicate the outputs of uh, proximity centers, sensors, like conventional uh, proximity sensors. We've trained the network to uh, to uh, to do this. So, and then purely on visual uh, on visual input, we are running a, we're running a car around the corridor, and it uh, it's a simple reactive controller that kind of replicates what the car would be doing if it had uh, proximity sensors. But again, this is a purely passive system which only uses vision. It does crash sometimes, uh, but here we go. Uh, Okay, and, and finally, I want to show you this results, which is from putting this uh, the systems onto uh, onto UAVs. So here we, we mounted this on a on a on a UAV platform, and here we are running a code that tries to detect the gates, and then the controller is flies flies through the gates. So again, all the vision computation is done on SCAMP chip. I'm I'm not quite sure what was the what was is probably something like 500 or 600 hertz that the vision uh, computing is being done. But more, the bulk of computation is done again on the, on the vision sensor, so the controller has a relatively easy job. This actually next slide shows what the visions, what the, so we never output any images, even those gray, those binary images are only output here for the purpose of uh, debugging. Actually, all you output is the locations of the gates and their orientations. So entire computation is done, is done on the sensor itself. Okay, and so that's really the summary of my talk. Okay, the, the kind of sensor that we are working on is a sensor in which each pixel has a kind of simple but but fully fledged processor, let's say. The processors that can execute user code. And so all computations is done on the sensor. Only meaningful data is read out, and that meaningful data may be, you know, whatever is meaningful to you, you can you can write your program. Uh, we by doing this, we can achieve high speed and low latency in a, in a co compact system, which at the same time is, is, is quite easy to program because the, the programs that you write for those, you know, you have to figure out how to do this on, on pixel level, but it, they, are, they, are, they are quite conventional programs. Uh, I, and just the acknowledgement, so uh, the, the, the Manchester team, so Steve Carey, Janning Chen, Alex Lopez, David Barr, there are people who work on chip design, most of the applications are actually done by our collaborators. So most of the movies and, uh, and I, I've shown are coming either from the University of Bristol or from Julian Martel at, at Zurich or, or, or Stanford. Uh, 
and the funding is from from uh, from a UK uh, research council. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dudek. Very very interesting talk. So. So we have a couple of questions. Augusto is asking, what is the size and the weight of, of your sensors? Well, the size and the weight, uh, the, uh, the, the actual chip, okay, it's a, it's a silicon chip. It's a 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter uh, silicon. Once you put it in a package, that becomes uh, you know, a little bigger. Once you build a camera around it, that becomes even bigger. And I, I guess it, the question is how well you engineer it. So uh, our camera is, uh, you know, it's, it's about I think 200 grams or something like this, but uh, it's a, it, it's more of a kind of engineering problem on, on, on how to how to make it make it smaller. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Juan Pablo is, is asking, is the Scan Five available for purchase? It's it's not available for purchase, uh, but it's uh, it's available for collaborations. So I t we are we are we are quite happy to we so we've. We have some, we have not a huge number of, it's an academic project, it's not a, we, we don't have a huge number of systems, but we have some that we are happy to share, share with others uh, if they are doing interesting things with it. So if people have ideas of, of what they would like to do, please, uh, please talk to me and we, we may be, I mean, it may be difficult this, this week because uh, we are, we are all locked, locked out, but uh, at some point uh, we may be able to, uh, lend you a system to do experiments with. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question, what is the pixel pitch? What is the maximum pixel density you can have? Okay, so on, on SCAMP5, the pixel pitch is 32 microns, 32 microns. So it's a, so the, in a sense that kind of limits what, what sensible resolutions uh, of the, you can have with, with sensible size of a lens. Uh, in a, this chip, however, has been again fabricated in a pretty old silicon technology. We could, we if we had access to technologies like like Prophecy has with a with a Sony sensor on on top of a of a processor chip, then obviously we could shrink those uh, further. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, yeah, another question: Can a pixel communicate with their neighbors uh, or with every other pixel? Yes, that's right. So, so yes, yeah, so so pixel, yeah, pixel can talk to its nearest neighbors. So the the you can fetch data from 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 your uh, one of your four neighbors. And of course, if you want to fetch the data, uh, very often what we what we do is is write algorithms that that operate over larger local areas. But you can just pass data. So you one neighbor passes to another and another over a few clock cycles, you can gain access to a data from from a small neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so if there is no other questions, uh, yeah, let's thank again Professor Dudek.